Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you for this webinar uh, for, uh, with the title EU Trade Challenges and Opportunities in a Rapidly Changing Environment. Uh, this event is part of the Future Proofing Europe project, which is supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs. And I'm very pleased to welcome today Dr. Sabina Vyand, Director General for Trade at the European Commission, who has taken time out of her very busy schedule to speak to us today. Uh, Dr. Vayan will speak to us for about 20 minutes and so, and then we will go to the question and answer with our audience. And as usual, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. And uh, please feel free to send your questions in during the course of the session as they occur to you. And we will come to you once um, Dr. Vayan has finished her presentation. And just a reminder that today's presentation and Q&A are both on the record. And please also feel free to join the discussion using the handle at, on Twitter, using the handle at IIEA. Uh, in her address, um, Sabina will um, speak about how geopolitical and geoeconomic challenges are affecting international trade and their implications for the EU trades policy. And furthermore, she will assess the role that trade plays in strengthening the competitiveness of EU business and advancing the EU economic and security interests while supporting the EU green transition. And this is particularly relevant now that there is so much of an expectation that trade uh, is uh, uh, used for as a tool for broader political objectives. So now may I formally introduce um, Dr. Vyand. Dr. Vyand is Director General for Trade at the European Commission. And prior to her current role, she was Deputy Chief Negotiator at the Commission's Task Force for the preparation of the Brexit negotiations with the United Kingdom uh, from October 2016 to, to May 2019. And we have, and I know all our member states um, partners have paid tribute to her for her very hard work uh, in, in this uh, task uh, for the three years um, for following the Brexit referendum. Uh, she was the director in the Secretariat General of the Commission in charge of policy coordination on economic and social and environmental policies before joining DU Trade in 2016 as Deputy Director General, covering multilateral trade policy, trade relations with North America and European neighborhood uh, countries, as well as trade defense. And throughout her commission uh, career, um, Sabina has been centrally involved in the trade, economic and industrial policy areas in a variety of role, including in, in cabinets. So given the, um, events of the past week where we've had a special council uh, on um, a new European competitiveness deal. Um, and we've had the report from Enrico Lette on um, uh, the single market. We're expecting a report from Mario Draghi on competitiveness in the EU. Against that background, Sabina, I'm very happy to give you the floor. And once again, thank you for coming to us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marie. I'm very happy to be with you. Um, and uh, I would like to thank the IIEA for the invitation and for giving me this opportunity. Um, the great Oscar Wilde uh, once said, I adore simple pleasures. They are the last refuge of the complex. And I think the IIEA knows everything about complexity, um, not least uh, through your project on the future-proofing Europe. Uh, which I think is a very welcome uh, contribution to the debate on how do we navigate as Europeans a world that has become a lot more complex. Because today for trade policy as for other policies, um, avoiding complex questions is not an option. Nowadays, it's all about managing complexity. When talking about international trade, some people tend to focus on the challenges, the more negative or defensive interests, uh, that come to mind, while others on the opportunities. Now, you marry both in the title of, of uh, uh, today's event, and I will try to do justice uh, to both. Uh, but all too often, we have to recognize that the two groups uh, talk past each other with a heavy focus on just one side of the story. This, of course, is even more tempting, given the rapidly changing environment we are operating in. 
yet this line of uh, reasoning is oversimplistic, we need to consider both challenges and opportunities. This has been the logic behind our concept of open strategic autonomy, and more recently, our dive into economic security. The role of trade policy as the link between the single market and the external world is to properly balance the two to maximize the benefits for the EU. Here in Ireland, of course, uh, you're confronting this balance on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, benefiting as you long have been from openness while grappling with some of the implications of the growing uh, geopolitical fragmentation. Uh, so today I would like to focus on three things. First, how our environment has changed and is continuing to change. Second, what we have been doing about it in terms of trade policy. And three, where we may be heading from here. Well, first, the new uh, environment. Uh, things have changed massively over the last decade. We've gone uh, from the Cold War to hyper-globalization, the establishment of WTO, the accession of China to the WTO, and its massive growth, together with its externalities, both positive in terms of lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, but also its negative fallout. Um, if we look at the China shock uh, of around 10 years ago, that has hit different parts of the world and different parts of Europe uh, differently. Um, we have throughout these decades seen massive economic growth that has accompanied these changes. At the same time, we've also experienced enormous crises, including the 1997 uh, Asian financial crisis, the 2008 uh, global economic crisis with the European financial crisis, more recently, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. All of these show how integrated and interconnected we are. A sneeze on one side of the world can lead to pneumonia on the other. More recently, all this has become a lot more complicated by geopolitical development the increasing rivalry between the US and China, Russia's war of aggression, and more recently, the developments in the Middle East, which are deeply worrying. In case anybody was still in doubt, I think these developments made one thing very clear. The era of stability has come to an end. We are now operating in a much more volatile and uncertain environment with a growing risk of economic fragmentation. And such fragmentation can cost all of us dearly. According to the IMF, global trade fragmentation through trade barriers could lead up to a 5 to 7% reduction in global output in the long term. If we add technological decoupling to the mix, losses could go even up to 12% of GDP. Worryingly, these crises have also created more structural changes as regards the approach to international economic engagement. For decades, we have taken many truths for granted the benefits of interdependence, the pursuit of efficiency, and the strength of rules-based cooperation. Today, we are facing a new environment. With growing tensions in geopolitics and international trade, supply chain disruptions due to the pandemic and now the wars, we have clearly seen an inward turn of economic policy. In particular, this environment has led to a paradigm shift from a focus on efficiency to a desire for more resilience, or economic security, as we also like to call it. In this context, mutual economic interdependence is often perceived as a risk rather than an opportunity. So let me come to my second point. How has trade policy been adapting to these uh, challenges? For some, the reaction to these problems may seem obvious. They suggest the doubling down on defending the EU's market. But let me say very clearly, protectionism does not protect. Let's look at some figures. A recent study has shown that a 1.7 percentage point increase in tariffs leads to a 1% decrease in output and a 2% decrease in labor productivity after five years. But as regards the cost of protection, and we don't need to rely on studies, we have a very real life example with the uh, Trump uh, trade tariff uh, experiment in 2018. Uh, where we saw that uh, these tariffs reduced the U.S. monthly real income by $1.4 billion uh, when they were introduced. They also restrained U.S. exports. After netting out the impact of retaliatory tariffs, the U.S. export growth was about 2% lower than it would have been otherwise. 
And the industries that were more exposed to the tariffs had a higher reduction in manufacturing employment by 2.3%. So what is actually needed is an approach that maintains open markets while preventing and when necessary responding to situations where our openness is exploited and abused. We could see uh, uh, the benefits of such an approach in how trade and EU trade policy have helped the EU and its member states in tackling various shocks resulting from these crises. First, during the COVID-19 pandemic, governments initially took restrictive measures on masks, uh, on protective equipment in general, also in the beginning on vaccines. But then they backtracked very rapidly because they saw that the only way to deal with the shortage of supply that we saw was through international cooperation and that actually global supply chains were more resilient to shock, to external shocks than shorter, more localized ones. As a result, since the pandemic, diversification through open trade has become a core component of strategies towards greater resilience of supply chains. Second, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has made us painfully aware of our one-sided dependence on Russian energy. Also in this context, the EU has clearly benefited from our diverse global trade links. In 2022, the EU increased imports of raw materials and energy from Canada by 25% in order to diversify away from Russia in the context of EU sanctions and uh, Russian countermeasures. So uh, both uh, these examples show the importance of diversified trade relations. Um, the EU trade policy has also strengthened our ability to pursue strategic uh, interests um, in the context of the war. We have used our trade tools to support Ukraine in facing Russia's aggression. Apart from our trade sanctions against Russia, we provided lifeline trade support to Ukraine's battered economy through various means autonomous trade liberalization, the solidarity lanes, the priority action plans, which help to bring um, Ukraine closer to the single market. And our active trade engagement across the globe through our trade agreements and platforms has helped us enhance the competitiveness of uh, EU businesses by securing access to critical inputs and seeking export opportunities for them. Because we need to keep in mind that we are still a global leader in international trade. Uh, we are the most important trading partner for 54 countries uh, globally, which together represent 48% of global GDP. Um, our global trade network also supports resilience by ensuring more diverse supply chains. And in the last five years, we've left no stone unturned in order to further expand this network. In particular, we have concluded several trade negotiations including free trade agreements with New Zealand, Chile, and Kenya, our first sustainable investment facilitation agreement with Angola, an agreement with Japan on cross-border data flows, so important for the digital economy. And we have, of course, seen the first benefits from the entry into force of the FTA with uh, Vietnam. These agreements enhance our economic resilience. Um, take the example of the modernization of the agreement with Chile, uh, which is the EU's second largest source of uh, refined lithium, and that will enhance uh, our reliable sourcing of this key material for the green transition. But we are also deepening uh, our cooperation with partners through other flexible forms of engagement. And here I would like to mention the Trade and Technology Council, the digital trade agreements we are negotiating with Singapore and South Korea, we are looking for more sustainable investment facilitation agreements, notably with African partners who are very interested, and we want to build on our network of mutual recognition agreements in order to cut the cost of doing a business. Now, uh, agreements are only as good as their implementation, and that is why it's important that we have put during this mandate much more focus and resources on implementation and enforcement. Over the past five years, we've solved 140 trade barriers fully or partially in more than 30 countries, and this has helped boost EU exports in sectors such as agri-food, pharmaceuticals, and health. So let me come to my third point, uh, which is looking ahead. Uh, so um, it is still a little bit too early, at the risk of disappointing you, I have to say that. It is a little bit too uh, uh, early to talk about very concrete uh, projects 
for the next mandate, given that we have to wait for the European elections, uh, the composition of the European Parliament, the nomination of the key personnel uh, for the next mandate. But what is very clear is, and uh, the European Council last week has confirmed this, uh, there will be a very strong focus on competitiveness and economic security. And as we adapt to this new environment and shape our trade policy responses, we have to bear in mind that a proactive trade policy can support both aims. Trade engagement with other economies across the globe enhances supply chain diversification, and through that, both the EU's uh, competitiveness and its economic security. Um, the expectations are uh, certainly very high for the contribution that trade policy can make, but I would also like to agree with uh, what uh, Mary said at the beginning, uh, which is that trade policy cannot do this alone. But let me focus on the three key areas we will certainly have to work on in the next five years. First, it's the implementation of the economic uh, security strategy in order to reconcile the benefits of open markets and the mitigation of risk. The strategy balances competitiveness, resilience, and security objectives through uh, three pillars, promoting competitiveness, protecting economic security, and building partnerships across all sectors. Accordingly, in addition to our recent uh, PROTECT tool, which includes uh, the review of our investment screening regulation and the enhancement of our export control regime, we also continue to both expand our trade partnerships and promote, promote investment in our capacity. Second, focusing trade policy efforts on creating opportunities for our businesses and not falling into the trap of putting all attention solely on defending ourselves. This means continuing to seek stability in international economic governance as much as possible through pursuing a future uh, WTO reform and by deepening uh, links with uh, various partners in the world. Now, for the twin transition, um, the digital transformation and uh, the decarbonization of our economy, we all, countries around the world, need more trade, investment, and market access. But it is also clear that the WTO in its current stage will not be able to provide this increased market access because moving forward with 166 members is just too hard. So that is why um, the search for market access focuses more on bilateral engagement. And here we have a, a revival of our bilateral trade agenda. We have recently resumed negotiations with Thailand and the Philippines. Malaysia is very keen to uh, take up negotiations again with us as well. And all this in addition to ongoing negotiations with Mercosur, India, Indonesia, Australia, we will have to see when they will be ready to come back to the negotiating table. From our side, we still think that an agreement uh, would be in both sides' interest. Then, as I mentioned, uh, there, were, there are the digital uh, trade agreements, and we would like to link up these various agreements in a plurilateral uh, uh, effort that would bring together similar, uh, countries with similar approaches, like-minded countries, uh, in the area of uh, data protection and uh, free data flows with trust. So that is a project we are aiming to pursue in the next mandate. But we also have to uh, consider the difficulties we have of getting to the finishing line with a good outcome. And these difficulties are both in the negotiations with our trading partners and internally in terms of the ratification of trade agreements. Now, externally, I think we have to recognize that we have pushed away a number of partners we need through our increased use of autonomous trade measures, unilateral measures that other countries see uh, as imposing on them extraterritorial effects of our legislation. And they resent that. We hear that increasingly on measures like the deforestation regulation, uh, less so uh, and in a different manner, there are also concerns about the implementation of CBAM even if uh, the legitimacy um, of the approach is recognized, but there are huge concerns. So we need to think about our attractiveness uh, for our trading partners, and we need to put together offers that go beyond trade policy. 
uh, one of the elements or one of the approaches that allows us to combine various instruments is the global gateway, which brings together trade and investment policy, uh, but also concrete investment projects and the financing. That is the type of approach, a combination of our various tools that we will have to use to greater effect uh, going forward. Um, and one of the areas of synergies is trade and climate. This is something we need to pursue in the WTO in a way that shows that this involves opportunities for everyone and not beggar thy neighbor policies. I think we have a lot of convincing to do here. Uh, in, internally, I'm looking forward to your ideas on what we can do uh, to promote uh, a better acceptability of uh, our trade uh, uh, agreements. Um, not so much in the public, because uh, recent Eurobarometer studies show that actually there's a strong public support for trade policy. But what we see sometimes in uh, national governments, in national parliaments, is an amplification of uh, very specific concerns. And we need to find a way to deal with that in a way that allows us to reap the benefits of our engagement with the rest of the world. So um, here, I think the key word is political leadership. Um, and that is something we can only support from Brussels, but it actually has to be done in the, in the countries themselves. Um, I wanted to uh, mention a further point, which is of course, how do we deal with the disruption uh, fueled by the US-China tensions? And here, uh, we have to recognize that there is um, an accumulation of the negative externalities of China's economic model on the rest of the world. Um, and this is particularly visible in the form of overcapacity, which are massive and structural, uh, and which are being built through non-market policies and practices. We have a country uh, that accounts now for uh, 30 percent, over 30 percent of manufacturing capacity globally, and that is simply not sustainable. So the ideal thing would, of course, be for China to address this at the root, because also we think that this is not a sustainable model uh, for China itself. Uh, but bear, uh, uh, in the absence of Chinese action in this respect, we will have to continue deploying our trade defense instruments, which are effective uh, where they use them. But we also need to uh, work with other parts uh, in order to address these externalities of China's model. Uh, and here we are thinking about a G7 plus engagement in order to ensure that we coordinate our action to protect ourselves uh, against uh, the flood of Chinese overcapacity being exported while at the same time making sure that other countries uh, do not become collateral damage uh, in our attempt to level the playing field. So this is certainly something that will keep us busy, as does our relationship with the US, where we will have to be prepared for uh, all uh, scenarios. In any scenario, we need both a positive agenda, uh, where we can work with the US, where we can enhance the so central uh, transatlantic trade and investment relationship, that we also need to have instruments to defend ourselves against uh, 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 punitive action uh, by a uh, US uh, administration. And from that point of view, the toolbox of instruments that we have, whether they are level playing field oriented or security related, or the anti-coercion instrument, uh, which we have added to our statute book, but not as applied. Uh, all this is helpful in order to keep everyone honest and try to stick to the rules-based system to the extent uh, possible. So I think for today, I have to leave it here with a few pointers on what we are going to do in the next mandate. We haven't uh, thought it through all in the most minute detail. So uh, this is a good moment where we can also place with me some ideas on what we should focus on in the next uh, mandate in terms of trade policy and beyond. And with that, I will leave it here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sabina. You covered a lot there and um, uh, a lot that is uh, hugely valuable for us to know, um, particularly uh, 
points that um, uh, the number of trade agreements, bilateral trade agreements, uh, and the instruments you're deploying, the possibility that there is is a defensive instrument. Um, I do have a number of questions. I just had uh, one before we move on, um, Sabina. The, the Council last week uh, had a very lengthy full day discussion on competitiveness, but there were a number of difficulties uh, where they could not reach agreement. Could I just ask you, what are the main stumbling blocks? Obviously, the single market, uh, there are problems there. Is it regulatory, the regulation that's being proposed? What are the blockages to move forward in these areas? Uh, sorry, I had my, my earphones did not work properly. In what uh, negotiations particularly? In, I, we were looking at the European Council discussions last week um, and the, the discussion on competitiveness and um, not all member states were agreed. Uh, and I'm uh, uh, the question really is, what were the blockages? Where are member states uh, holding uh, back uh, movement in this area? OK, I think that was a very I mean, like charity, competitiveness starts at home. And uh, I would really like to encourage people reading, if not yet done, the letter report, which is excellent in that respect. Yes. Uh, because it points very clearly where we have been sleeping at the wheel uh, on the single market. Now, the discussion at the European Council was very much about uh, the capital markets union. Because, as I said, we all need investment for the twin transition. And that investment cannot just come from uh, public money because there isn't enough. And there is private money, but it needs to be channeled. And at the moment, we do not have a capital market that could compete with the US. But here again, the banking structures and the financial sector structures of our member states are quite different. And that makes it a little bit more challenging to find a common way forward. Um, I was, however, encouraged by the fact that the discussion seems to have been deeper uh, on the capital markets union, as well as on the determination of a number of member states to move forward in an enhanced cooperation format, if not all 27 can go along. Uh, that was better than the usual Sunday speech exhortations that we have to finalize or complete the capital markets union. Um, so I think that was one of the issues that was the most hotly debated. What I thought, and that brings me back to my um, uh, the remark I made, basically trade policy is the reflection of the single market externally. And we are only as strong in our engagement with the rest of the world as we are strong as our internal market is strong. And here, I think we have to look at the way we regulate the internal market, the single market. I think we have become a little bit too complacent with what we call the Brussels effect, i.e. we regulate uh, for uh, the single market and we say others then just have to follow. Now, that does not reflect the fact that our weight in the global economy is going down as others are rising up. And uh, the global south and the emerging and developing economies they do not simply want to copy our uh, legislation and they say, who has appointed you world regulator? Yeah. So I think we have to take unregulatory cooperation. We have to take a proper cooperative approach. Um, and that again was put very well in the letter report where he said, when regulating the single market, we need to take into account um, our global competitiveness. So we have to regulate knowing what is the global economy in which we uh, uh, in which we compete. So I think this is a challenge on how we go forward on regulating for the single market. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. I think um, I have a question here, um, uh, Sabina, from uh, Bernard O'Connor, Department of Justice. I think actually in your talk you may have answered it, but I, I will give it to you in case you need to uh, add anything to it. Bernard says that um, Commissioner Vestager recently stated that the EU was playing whack-a-mole. Um, I don't know if you know that English expression yes. of bashing anything that comes across uh, across the, the line. Uh, he, uh, Commissioner Vestager said in relation to case by 
uh, case TDI and foreign subsidy measures? And what can the Commission do about systematic overcapacities, particularly in China, to avoid the need to repeatedly whack a mole? I think you probably have dealt mostly with that question, but you may find you, uh, there's something you want to add to it. Yeah, no, happy to do so. Um, now, first of all, the whack a mole approach is still very effective. So most of our trade defense measures actually apply to China um, and the distortive uh, uh, aspects uh, of their economic policy, whether that is, uh, you know, dumping or uh, subsidization. So where we take measures, uh, we can see that they lead to a 90% reduction uh, in the concerned exports from China. We've also adapted our approach in order to capture the fact that China is sometimes channeling both investment and trade flows through other countries. So we are, for instance, tackling trans the transnational impact of Chinese uh, 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 subsidization in countries like Indonesia. But it is true, this is very resource intense, but it is effective. But we also have measures which are slightly more um, comprehensive, like the safeguard action we have in steel. And we are currently looking at, uh, I mean, this. Uh, the measure had been prolonged two years ago until uh, July 2024, and we are now looking at whether we need to uh, uh, prolong it further. Uh, my personal opinion is that we will arrive at the conclusion that we will have to. So we are also taking safeguard action. What is important to us is that we act in line with our international commitments, because if we stop doing that, others will walk away from the global trading system. And we would be the ones suffering most from that, together with uh, developing countries who rely uh, on the safeguards against protectionism that multilateral rules provide. But we can do more by cooperating, as I said, with like-minded uh, countries, market-oriented economies, uh, in a G7 plus format. This is currently being discussed in the G7 in the run-up to the summit. And we are working with other partners, like, for instance, the Japanese, on how can we address overcapacities. So I think um, this is very important because we, are, we currently see that we are affected by measures taken by the US to protect themselves against unfair competition from China. But we end up being collateral damage here. European companies end, and end up being collateral damage. And that is something we would like to avoid through a plurilateral cooperation. Thank you. Thank you for the elaboration there. Uh, I have another question from uh, John Hughes from the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. Uh, in your view, Sabina, is the open free trade agenda and the economic development it supports being held hostage by other non-trade issues? Um... I'm not sure I would have chosen these words, but I understand the question. Um, I do think that we have to have greater clarity about what we want in relations with a given country or region. And then we have to align our interests and our instruments. And from that point of view, I think we have to get away from an approach where we have one instrument that tries to hit several different interests at the same time. Because, you know, that's what you learn as a first year student uh, in economics at university, that that doesn't work. Um, so I think we have to look at what can trade, uh, trade agreements regulate the way we trade. But they are not well suited to deal with issues that go beyond the trade field proper. Um, like how do we cooperate with countries in order to move forward on uh, combating climate change? That requires different tools. Now, that doesn't mean that trade agreements should ignore environmental or climate issues or labor issues for that matter, because we build our trade relationships on a shared commitment to the Paris Agreement, uh, to combating climate change, to sticking to multilateral environmental agreements, etc. That is the, uh, on the ILO, the International Labour Organization. So we build our relationship on this as a platform. But to really move forward, 
we should not use trade agreements, but we need to use other cooperation uh, mechanisms. And we have those. We have green partnership agreements where we couple our support with, uh, uh, um, with technical assistance, uh, with investment projects, etc. Um, but I, so I think there is an issue where we need to be clearer about what we want and then focus on the essential. And there is even more of an agreement, and I alluded to that in, in, in my last remarks, we have to be very careful that our autonomous way of regulating the single market does not alienate our partners. So this is not so much a question of trade agreement, it's a matter of how we present ourselves as a regulator to the outside world. And there I think we should learn some lessons from the opposition we are currently facing with respect to the deforestation regulation. Not because we should make apologies about the objective that we pursue, but we have to recognize that the means are extremely burdensome and very difficult to meet for developing countries and notably for small and medium sized businesses and smallholders in these countries. So again, I'm back to Mr. Letta's report. We need to factor in the external world when regulating for the single market. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive reply. In a sense, um, the question from um, Dr. Alan Matthews, uh, who's an IIEA member and economist, uh, picks up on, on a remark you made and, and brings forward um, uh, also in relation to the last point. He says that um, you refer to the costs of global trade fragmentation. But he questions, is the EU contributing to trade fragmentation through its increasing emphasis on environment, environmental conditions in trade, while its insistence on sustainability elements is, in free trade agreements is clearly a stumbling block in FTA negotiations, for example, with Mercosur and India. What is the right balance in future between securing market access, promoting sustainability, and ensuring also a level playing field for EU producers who must comply with the higher standards? Well, that is the $64 million question. Um, now, okay. Uh, this is, I mean, it, it's a very complex question. So first of all, I think in terms of trade and sustainability, if we build our uh, in-trade agreements, the, 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 the trade and sustainable development chapters, if we build those on shared commitments to international agreements, that should not be a problem. Where we face resistance is if we say, we make the enforcement of this commitment to multilateral agreements um, based on sanctions, subject to sanctions. That is when countries come and say, wait a moment. Um, we, the Paris Agreement is non-punitive, bottom-up action, voluntary, etc. Now you guys come and say, we will enforce your voluntary commitments through EU trade sanctions. That doesn't work. And I think here we have learned a lesson uh, yes, there are countries like New Zealand with whom we can have these sort of sanctions because they both agree on that. But it's also very clear we will only be able to agree a sanctions-based approach with countries with whom both sides know they will never use it. Same for Canada. They are keen to have that. But that is symbolic politics. It is clear that we will not be able uh, to have such an approach with India and Indonesia. And here, I would like to refer to our approach to trade and sustainable development, where we said it is a country-specific approach. No one size uh, fits all. Uh, this is something that the Council subscribed to, the European Parliament subscribed to it. But when we have the concrete discussion, you can see that they still come and say, no, 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 we want the full Monty. We want the, sa the sanctions-based approach. And that is where the truth of, uh, uh, I mean, we will come to the crunch point um, when we see more clearly where we are heading, for instance, with a country like India. Um, once we get to the point where we say, here we have an offer on the table of an agreement that is economically meaningful, that is future oriented, that creates a stronger link with an important uh, player in the world economy, um, and somebody who we also need uh, to have closer links with geopolitically, but this is what we can achieve on trade and sustainable development. That is when the member states and the European Parliament will have to say whether that is good enough or not. For the moment, that test has not yet happened because we are not yet in a stage where we can say we are seeing eye to eye even on basic market access with India. 
but we will have to give reality to this uh, country specific approach. And for Mercosur, it's again, uh, it's, it's the same. So um, we will, but we will take as commission, we will take our responsibility to come with something which is good for the economy and good for the environment uh, and climate change, but it needs to be more cooperation based approach and, and not, uh, uh, and not uh, uh, punitive. Um, but as I said, the real challenge comes from our autonomous instruments, which uh, apply independently of trade agreements. And that is what we need to fix in the, in the next uh, mandate. Now, there is a discussion about uh, level playing fields, uh, saying that EU producers, I think it has come forward notably with respect to the agricultural sector, saying EU producers are subject to so stringent rules uh, that, our that our competitors from other parts of the world don't have to respect, that is unfair. Well, first, I think this requires a very close look. We have done, I mean, this is a debate known under the uh, name of mirror clauses. I think it's uh, very much push, pushed by the French under this heading. Now, there are cases of international cooperation, uh, of, of international uh, challenges, where you can justify fixing also rules on production methods on the products you import. We do that, for instance, in the area of antimicrobial resistance, because there is a global agreement that says we need to prevent you know, uh, these antibiotics uh, becoming ineffective. So here we need to prohibit the use of antibiotics, certain antibiotics uh, in, in, um, in agricultural production. So where this is justified by a global concern that is universally recognized, we can have rules on production methods. Otherwise, we just have uh, uh, rules on product standards. No product can enter the EU market that does not fulfill our product standards. But production methods is, of course, something where we are very much insisting that we are free to fix these production methods ourselves. But guess what? So do our partners. And if you start discussing with a country like Argentina on, um, well, but you see European farmers are subject to such strict rules that you, don't, uh, that you are not subject to, they tell you, wait a moment. If I look at uh, beef uh, production method uh, in Argentina and the EU, you guys don't look so good, do you? Uh, and by the way, you are distorting international competition through massive agricultural subsidies, which are partly based or largely based on the need to contribute to environmental protection, etc. So you cannot have your cake and eat it, which means that in these issues, we really have to be uh, more granular. We need to have a discussion, where can we also help move international standards forward? Where is there a consensus on production methods that we can insist on? But on other areas, we also have to give our partners the respect for their regulatory autonomy that we are so keen on claiming for ourselves. And we have to be a little bit more honest in the way we look at us, at ourselves, um, because uh, we are not always the ones with the highest standards, contrary to what we like to think. Um, if you look at some of the environmental regulation, again, in Argentina, it's more stringent uh, than what we have in the EU. Uh, so that may come as a surprise, but that shows that we really have to, um, we really have to take a more cooperative approach uh, and a more granular approach to these issues. Sorry, this Thank was you. long, but it is a fundamental no, issue no. of trade policy. That was hugely interesting. And just mentioning Mercosur, um, Sabina, I noticed the huge emphasis that the US is putting on its trade policy with South America, mainly in the search for um, locking in rare metals uh, in their agreement and in the whole industrial competitiveness. And just a quick question, because I have more. Uh, how close do you think we might be to a Mercosur? Is that still in the um, in the realm of um, long term? Um, I, no, we are engaged in, uh, in negotiations, but we also see that um, our trading partners in uh, Latin America um, are resenting our unilateral measures. Mm -hmm. And most of the discussion in the last few months was exactly about um, you have been moving the goalposts 
uh, you on the EU side uh, since uh, the conclusion of the negotiations in 2019. Um, and this, we need to adjust the agreement in order to reflect this. So we are currently looking at how can we give them reassurances that they will not be penalized by, for instance, the deforestation regulation, because the big issue is, of course, the fight against deforestation uh, with the Mercosur countries, notably with Brazil. Uh, how can we give them these reassurances through uh, accompanying the agreement with cooperation? So the negotiations are going on um, in an intensive uh, pace. Um, I certainly hope that they are not long term, uh, but uh, you know whether you call it short or medium term is a matter of uh, of uh, personal taste. Um, everyone knows that we will not conclude them finally. I mean, the, the additional instrument uh, negotiations, we will not conclude them before the European elections. And uh, that means that our Mercosur partners now try to get the maximum out of the time they think they have. So I think we will have to create clarity fairly rapidly about what is the moment uh, uh, in which to conclude. And then we will have to tell the member states and the European Parliament what we think we are able to get and what are the things we may not be able to get uh, that we would have wanted in an ideal world, um, but uh, that we have found different ways of cooperating on the challenges that, um, that uh, both sides have to uh, deal with. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity on that. I have a question, Sabina, from Professor John O'Hagan, Professor of Economics in Trinity College, uh, Dublin. Firstly, he thanks you for the excellent talk. And he asks, to what extent do you think that extensive trade interdependence reduces or raises security risks uh, in the EU? Um, yes, well, I think um, the wider your network of trade and investment partners, the more interdependence you have without one-sided dependencies. I think at the moment we have a confusion in the debate because we have all seen with respect to Russia, the risk of dependency. Now, I remember the discussions which were only a few years, which were even after uh, Russia's uh, illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, we had discussions in the commission, in the EU, where we said, well, yes, we are dependent on Russia's energy, uh, but Russia is also dependent on selling us their energy, so there's no risk there. I think we now have learned that uh, one-sided dependencies can easily be weaponized uh, if a country uh, basically ignores the economic cost of this. The economic rationality is not the only rationality, and uh, economic, uh, economics do not prevent the weaponization of trade and investment relations. So the lesson we should draw from that is not to say, let's you know, close in on ourselves and try and produce everything inside the EU. That just does not work. That is inefficient. It is sometimes, if you look at the geological availability of raw materials, it's even geologically not possible, um, let alone uh, uh, economically viable. Uh, but we need to widen uh, our networks of uh, partners so that we have alternative uh, sources available. Um, sometimes this is we, we have these discussions also with respect to China. Um, this is part of the whole de-risking debate. Now we are not in a scenario of decoupling uh, with China as we are in a scenario of decoupling with Russia. So I insist on the differentiation between the two. But I think on the de-risking, uh, we have to see that we need to also have alternatives to China. Um, and that is why it is so important that we have, uh, that we continue developing our network of FTAs, but that we also have different types of agreement because an FTA, a fully fledged FTA is not appropriate for just any partner. So that is why we are doing critical raw materials partnerships, sometimes building on existing FTAs like with Canada, sometimes outside FTAs, sometimes preceding an FTA, I hope, as with Australia. So we are building different sorts of, of partnerships, but diversification contributes both to efficiency and to, uh, that, uh, uh, to resilience, and it reduces the cost of the insurance policy you have to take out in order to protect yourself against the weaponization of trade relations. 
Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive one. Uh, another question I have is from Orla Quinn, who's an IIEA board member. Could you comment on the effectiveness of trade sanctions against Russia and are there any serious proposals to strengthen them? Uh, yes. Um, so I think we are doing analysis as our other partners. Uh, we're doing an analysis of the effectiveness of our trade sanctions. Now, of course, if your yardstick for effectiveness is, has it moved uh, uh, Russia to stop the war and to withdraw from Ukraine, the answer is these sanctions have not been efficient, have not been effective. But if you ask yourself, have these sanctions substantially increased the cost of waging war for Russia, then they are working. So what we need to focus on, we obviously we are continuously through these various packages and we are now working on the 14th package. We are trying to close loopholes. Um, we are notably working on battlefield items, and that depends on information we get uh, from Ukraine, but also others. What are battlefield items that still have European or partners content? Because we are very much doing the sanctions in a, uh, in a format with the US, with Japan, with Korea, uh, with the UK, um, with Canada. Um, so where is still partners content? That, so then we expand uh, our sanctions. But now the attention is increasingly focusing on circumvention of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of our sanctions. And uh, uh, an Irish uh, countryman, David O'Sullivan, is our sanctions envoy. And he has the unenviable task of traveling around the world, or not around the world, but to those countries that we have identified as platforms for circumvention. So this is very much the case in Central Asia, uh, he's been working with uh, Turkey. He's been working, uh, of course, also uh, with all the, the Central, um, Central Asian uh, countries. Um, and I think that is hugely important that we tackle um, uh, circumvention. Uh, we are also tackling circumvention through China, which seems to be the biggest channel at the moment. It's no easy task, uh, but I think uh, but that, again, is a little bit of a whack-a-mole approach because you close down one channel of circumvention and another one opens up. So another case of whack-a-mole, uh, but there's no alternative but to really uh, uh, continue addressing this. Thank you indeed. Yes, and we, we tracked David's um, progress. He, he spoke to us recently. In fact, he was our director general until last year when um, uh, President von der Leyen kidnapped him back for the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have a couple more questions and I know we're running out of time. Um, I have a question, um, Sabina, from uh, Idil Uze Uzon on the packaging and uh, uh, packaging waste regulation, which you probably are not uh, going to welcome, really. Uh, they, he says that the uh, this regulation includes measures contrary to international trade rules and that DG Trade warned against it, but the final version is moving forward. Uh, does DG Trade plan to take any action in this? Well, um, I will not pronounce myself on the legality of the measure, as you will understand. Um, it is indeed something that came up late in the co-decision process between Council and Parliament. And it is one of these areas where we suffered from uh, the uh, lack of coherence between internal rulemaking and external policies. Um, so um, it was unfortunately uh, there was no willingness on the side of the um, of the member states uh, to reconsider uh, the proposal. Uh, this had been handled indeed by um, the industry ministers without any consideration of the external impact. That is something we need to get better at inside the Commission already. And we need to have more impact assessments. Uh, but in this case, it was, came really out of the uh, process between the co-legislators and in the council at a fairly late stage. And we, stopped, we, came, we identified it too late. We now have to see what can we do in implementation in order to um, make this manageable. Um, and uh, we will have to see what we can do about this. But it really is a very good uh, case study in how not to go about regulating 
uh, but really something where you need to have a more joined up uh, approach. And again, this is not to the detriment of the environmental uh, recycling objective of the legislation. It's not about the what, it's about the how. Thank you. Um, I think possibly our last questions uh, are from two of our um, IIA researchers. Um, Sabina uh, Dillon, whom you met earlier, said you discussed your desire to address sustainable economic development and trade at the WTO level. And what lessons, he asks, has the EU learned from the failures of the Doha round to overcome divisions between the global north and global south that exist in approaches to this issue? And uh, Dara Lawler, who's a senior researcher also, do you see prospects over the next commission mandate for a modernization of the WTO rules with respect to new issues in trades, such as, for example, digital trade and greening trade? and progress with dis uh, unblocking the WTO's dispute settlement. Two WTO-related questions, yeah. uh, because you did so, lay stress on the need to, to maintain um, the multilateral organizational approach. Yeah, indeed. Now, I think what we have learned also from the last, um, from the last WTO ministerial is that moving forward multilaterally with all 166 is extremely difficult. Um, now, this being said, we need to, pre first of all, we are all very much focused, and I did that myself, uh, to focus on WTO reform. But we should not underestimate that the WTO rules in their current form already play for the stability of the system. They are the one and only protection against arbitrary discrimination on the basis of where products come from. And that is worth maintaining in itself. Now, on reform, I think we need to focus more on plurilateral approaches. On trade and climate, we should focus on the trade creating potential of this link. And we need to explain much better and much earlier our projects like CBAM uh, and have uh, open discussions in the WTO about those so that we can factor in concerns uh, that our trading partners have about the implementation of these measures. But as I said, it's plurilateral more than multilateral. Uh, that, is, that is the reality. And that also applies to digital trade. We have the um, e-commerce negotiations. We will see by the middle of the year how far we can get in, uh, in that setting. Um, and then we will have to see whether we build on that with a smaller group of countries, uh, I mentioned that we have the idea of a plurilateral agreement about uh, uh, digital trade and exchange, uh, free flow of data with trust. That is something we would do on top of what we can do uh, in the WTO plurilaterally with the e-commerce uh, moratorium. Now, one remark, because you refer to the Global South, one of the things I was struck by in uh, Abu Dhabi is there is no such thing as the Global South in the WTO. Actually, India torpedoed a lot of interest of Brazil uh, and South Africa. Brazil, in turn, took hostage interest of South Africa. So if anything, you can see that there is no homogenous uh, group of the Global South or even of the BRICS inside the WTO. What, however, is clear is that the EU needs to continue investing massively in a partnership with these countries, with the emerging economy, according to their different interests. Uh, I think that's what we did well for MC12 on the context, in the context of the, um, um, on the uh, context of the TRIPS uh, waiver for vaccine production. Uh, that was useful. Um, and I think we have to find ways of engaging with these countries much more, especially as, we, as the US is currently missing in action in terms of uh, moving forward with the WTO. So we need to build alternative partnerships and especially with the emerging economies. Thank you for that. And um, we hope that that can move forward. Finally, um, Sabine, could I ask uh, if you have any comments to address to us in Ireland, small, open, very open economy, uh, any comments you want to send our way? Well, I did allude to that in the very beginning. What we need is political leadership in order to be able to preserve the openness we have and to limit the actions that we need in order to protect ourselves against unfair trading practices to the minimum. 
And I know that, for instance, the debate about Mercosur is not easy in Ireland either. But what I would encourage you is to maintain a big picture approach to see what would such an agreement do for us geopolitically, geoeconomically. And then say, OK, are there areas where there may be negative fallout? And if so, what are the instruments we have to deal with that? So I think we have taken great care on the sensitive uh, agricultural products to have very limited market access. I mean, this is less than 1% uh, of EU consumption we are talking about, uh, and also uh, uh, of EU production. Uh, so the impact is limited. On top of that, we have safeguard me uh, mechanisms. And then I think we need to look at how do we organize and support agricultural policy inside the EU in order to strengthen the ability of the agricultural sector to operate in a global economy, because we are the biggest agricultural exporter. We are the ones that suffer most from agricultural protectionism. So encouragement to look at the uh, bigger picture think solutions rather than problems, um, and uh, maintain the advocacy uh, for trade openness, which has served Ireland, but also the EU in its entirety so well over the last decade. Thank you for that. We'll, we'll, take, um, we'll take those words home, uh, home with us. Sabina, we have come to the end of um, a really fascinating um, uh, event. Uh, we thank you sincerely for all you have shared with us. I think we can say we have a very much better view of uh, EU trade, EU, particularly what you're aiming to achieve in EU trade, the difficulties you have outlined, but also, I think, very positively, the way to overcome them. And um, uh, and also uh, the need for the support of member states in that. That also is a message. So thank you most sincerely for all of us. Um, we wish you well in the next few months in the transition period and, and in the study, as you say, of the important reports that are um, uh, coming online, the Lette report, which is, is so valuable, and um, the Mario Draghi. And, um, we hope that we won't see in any further council conclusions that uh, the capital markets um, will be put on the long finger uh, as they have been for years and years and years. So thank you most sincerely and um, we wish you well and indeed hope to see you again in the future.